Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to be looking at a little bit of breaking the apprenticeship myths this afternoon. Uh, and I've been chosen to do this one. And thinking about it, I'm probably quite a good one to do this because before I actually came into anything to do with apprenticeships, I had very little idea about them at all. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, and just some of the common misconceptions that people do have surrounding apprenticeships. So we'll look in a little bit of detail about what an apprenticeship actually is. Uh, some of the top apprenticeship myths that people have. Where an apprenticeship can take you. So what's good about having that apprenticeship and opportunities that are local to you. From Inspire Plus and then. You know, hopefully we'll have answered any questions that you may have had throughout this, uh, but if not, then feel free to get in touch with any of the education team and we will be happy to answer any questions. So what is an apprenticeship? It's a structured training programme which gives the young people opportunities to, to work towards a qualification. So in our apprentices cases, we do deliver a variety of different levels. We have a level two, uh, which is a community activator coach. We do some level three TA work and a uh, community and sport health officer. And then the level four sports coach uh, apprenticeship we run as well, which is a little bit longer than, than the previous two. So they are they're, they're slightly varied in length, but they serve the same purpose. They work towards qualification and this second bit, it talks about giving them that hands on experience. So it says gives each individual fantastic experience in the working world. So the majority of ours are based in schools. They're not all. Some are in coaching companies. Some could be uh, within the leisure industry. Uh, we have got some working for Inspire Plus ourselves. So it, as long as it's got something to do with the, the sort of sport and leisure industry, that's absolutely fine. But the majority of us, us work within primary schools. We have got some in secondary schools as well, but the majority of, of within the primary schools, simply because the primary schools have the sport premium funding, which enables them to, to employ them in the first place in many cases. Uh, it, and it's all about that, that hands-on experience. You know, we've got people going in, they work four days a week within their workplace, and then we deliver the course side of it one day a week. So the majority of their working week is spent within, in most cases, their schools, which does really throw them into everything. It exposes them to everything that happens within a school and gives them some really good hands on training throughout their working week. Uh, and for the majority of uh, apprentices, that's the thing that they love you know, going in and experiencing that, that work firsthand. And the nice thing about apprenticeships as well, obviously, it does come with a salary. So that they're getting paid while they're working. Nice phrase that is used is, is they earn while they learn. So th there's no training costs for, for the student, that's all covered, but they do get paid that salary. It's not going to make them millionaires overnight, right? But, but for a lot of them, that have come straight out of school or never worked before, that first pay pack is, is quite considerable in some cases for them. Uh, so yeah, they, they get paid and uh, they get that qualification at the end of the course as well. So like I say, this some of these were myths that I probably had before I st started working for Inspire Plus. I had very limited knowledge about apprenticeships and probably held some of these misconceptions, if I'm perfectly honest. So myth one, apprenticeships are for 16 to 24 year olds and school leavers. Obviously, some of them are. We do get a, a lot of our cohort, which is from that 16 to 24 year old bracket. Uh, we do get come, some uh, coming straight out of school as a school leavers, but it's not always the case. You know, my Norfolk cohort in particular has, has had quite a few examples that go outside of those parameters. So, for example, uh, I've got one of my level twos at the moment who's in his 40s. I had a couple of years ago someone who I went to school with and who was in my class at school. So same age as me, 49 years old. 
Uh, and he, he, they just wanted to change a career. Uh, they wanted to try something a little bit different, go and experience working within a school. And uh, the, the lad who's the same age as me, say lad, the man who's the same age as me, he's still within a school. So he, he completed his apprenticeship, really enjoyed that year. And uh, he, he's stayed in the education system, working as a teaching assistant in, in a couple of schools. So really enjoyed it. We've had people come back from uh, university and have qualified, possibly further down the line, thought, oh, I'm working in the school. And they've come and done this apprenticeship because it does give them some really good experience before they then almost commit to work in a, in a school. It does give them that year for them to decide whether they like it or not. And again, that was somebody, she was late 30s, got another one at the moment who's mid 30s and just wants, she's working in a school and has been for the last five or six years, just wants that extra qualification, wants to be able to put it on a CV to then proceed in, in what she likes doing, which is PE teaching. So myth two, we've got apprenticeships are only available in manual or construction jobs. And this was probably one that I did hold uh, but before I knew anything about them. I thought, yeah, you, you, you know, you get your apprenticeships in beauty you get your apprenticeships in bricklaying and that kind of thing. But I didn't realise there were so many opportunities for apprenticeships. We do a lot of sport ones, but I think, you know, if you wanted to pick something nowadays, there's probably an apprenticeship for it, which is brilliant. So, no, that they're not just in those roles. They're not manual or construction jobs. Yes, you do still get a lot of them, but there's so much more to apprenticeships than just those. Uh, apprenticeships are low quality and unvalued. Not at all. Uh, it does give them that that experience of working in a workplace. So I, I think future employers look at that and they uh, they value that experience that people have had, possibly over those uh, qualifications that, that people may have. You know, I think it's really important that you do get that workplace experience. Obviously, apprenticeships come with a lot of that. Myth four, apprenticeships only earn minimum wage. They can earn minimum wage, but it's not written. That's the minimum that they can get. So some employers value them uh, and may be willing to pay more than the minimum wage. So, for example, we had a school last year who they were looking for someone with a bit of quality and experience behind them. And as a result of that, they knew that they were going to potentially have to uh, pay a little bit better to get the candidate that they wanted. So they did pay, pay above that minimum wage. Uh, and apprenticeships mean you have to go to college and won't lead to full time job, etc. Another complete myth. If, if we look at uh, at the moment at apprenticeships, I've got a few, few in my cohort at the moment, actually, who are looking to do the university route. They haven't got any UCAS points. But they're able to access the university because of the experience that they've got. With regards, won't lead to a full time job. We're really, really proud of our figures at Inspire Plus. So it's nearly half of our learners stay within the school where they do their apprenticeship, uh, which is superb, really. You, you know, the school obviously see them work for the year, think, yeah, these are good. We want to keep hold of them. And that leads to that full time role within their school, whether that's them going on to do a higher level apprenticeship or being employed full time by the school in a teaching assistant capacity or, or uh, another role. You know, like I say, we are rightly really proud about that figure that we do get with schools retaining the apprentice that they took on. So we got some famous apprentices here and looking at these I thought I thought really all of these apprentices some of them I could guess from a sport background I could have probably guessed that David Beckham served an apprenticeship. Uh, happened a lot in football. In fact, 
he's exactly the same age as me. And I served an apprenticeship at, at, at the same time as him. Not a Man United, <laughs> Cambridge United, but it, it was. It was the same same apprenticeship. Uh, I think looking at the figures on the next page, he got paid a little bit more for me. I don't remember his mine being as much as that. But we've got people from various uh, world of work here. You, you know, we, we've got, got painting, we've got chefs, we've got singers, we've got fashion designers, footballers, actors. You know, there's lots and lots of different people on here. And we'll look at some of these. So I'll just let you have a look at that. Should have done a quiz on the last slide and you had to guess who they all were. You know, whether I'd, I'd have got all of them. There you go, David Beckham, 45 pound per week. I'm sure mine was 37 pound per week. Though memory is not as good as what it used to be. So yeah, even Elvis Presley learned to become an electrician on an apprenticeship. There you go. Every day is a school day. I never knew that before this. And we've got some of the rich list here of former apprenticeships. Uh, so Lord Bamford, chairman of uh, JCB, top in the list there with 3.15 billion. So top four, all billionaires there. Uh, other noteworthy names, a, a paltry 150 million. <laughs> so yeah, obviously money to be made going through an apprenticeship. So we said earlier, Nice phrase for uh, the apprentices to remem remember is you earn while you learn. So you are learning while you're getting paid. You're getting that hands on experience. And then at the end of the month, you get a nice wage come through. It, and it is it's that value of experience. You know, that is really, really important. We keep talking about that, but and. I keep at the moment my sort of buzz thing is all of these apprentices that I have who are looking to go off to university uh, and most of them don't have any UCAS points but the amount of universities that have come back and said uh, you know what have you been doing the last few years and they tell them about all the work that they've been doing in their school and all that experience that they've got and uh, th th there are a lot of universities now who are accepting them on courses just because of the quality of the experience that they've had so what do employers look for with, within an apprenticeship? I suppose when they're looking to employ one, it is very bespoke. They can mould it to what they, what they want from an apprentice. So it might be that they've got something with work going within their school that they really want to get an apprentice in for. It might be to raise the profile of extracurricular sport. It might be uh, a, a male role model within a school to work with sport. It might be one who's that they want to get in to do some intervention work with children that might not necessarily be interested in sport. They might look down a SEND angle and get, get an apprentice in to work with uh, some of the children with additional needs. So the, the nice thing is it is very varied. And as I say, you can bespoke it to, to what you want. But if I was an employer and I'm looking for an apprentice, I'm looking for somebody who is enthusiastic, who's willing to learn and who's hard working. You know, I, I think they're three really important things. They'll learn stuff along the way uh, they'll pick up other lots of really good qualities, things like organisation, things like communication. And that kind of thing is brilliant, regardless of whether they stay in the education system. It's brilliant for those transferable skills, regardless of what job they go on to do. Uh, and then you've got your opportunities after your apprenticeship. So it might be you do your apprenticeship. You think, yeah, brilliant. Absolutely loved it. Uh, this is what I want to do. And we support the school support them, whether they take them on or we support them looking for, for something else. Uh, but yeah, the, the majority of the apprentices that we have really, really in enjoy 
what they've done. They enjoy the year or the 18 months of the course that, that they've been doing and that they feel that they want to stay on, hopefully, within the school that we've, they've been working on, but certainly within the education system. And I think the nice thing now is uh, with sort of multi-academy trusts and federations of schools, even if a school couldn't keep them on, there might be opportunities within that trust or federation where another school possibly could, particularly if they've obviously been brilliant. Uh, some some decide, yeah, they like the working with children, but possibly not in a school environment. So they might go down that coaching route. Uh, some possibly decide, and it's a very, very small number, uh, uh, that they decide that it's probably not for them but they have learned some really, really good skills along the way. And as, as I say, they are transferable across any employment. So a little bit of a comparison between the apprenticeship and the higher education route. So 10 out of 10 people who complete an apprenticeship guarantee themselves employment. <coughs> It's not always the case of higher education uh, just because you're going off and, and getting a qualification and possibly a very good qualification. It doesn't necessarily guarantee you a job at the end of it. Uh, debt's always a big one. You know, when I was at university, the, the debts weren't anywhere near, obviously, what they are now. But it's it's gone up massively. You know, people are going to be paying those debts off for the rest of their life. So th that's one thing to, to weigh up. I'm not saying don't go off to higher education because you're going to get in debt, giving you some of the options. So you do earn while you learn uh, for the apprenticeship. Whereas on the other side, we've got the higher education. One in five end up in low or medium skilled jobs. So you go off and you do your higher education. You might go off to university. You might then not do what you wanted to do with that university degree and end up in a in a low or medium skilled job anyway. 71% stay with their employer. That is staggering, uh, but brilliant. You know, that's showing the, the power of the apprenticeships and the fact that people have obviously done well within their apprenticeship, that the employer thinks, yeah, this person's really good. We want to keep hold of them. Qualifications aren't always included uh, in, in other jobs. You, you might get some bolt-ons, you might get some workplaces that, you know, add extra things, but it's not always the case. We do within Inspire Plus, there are some little bolt-ons that we can add on to give <coughs> students some extra qualifications. We do a few different qualifications that do give them some UCAS points if they did need them. Uh, and talking about apprenticeships which are in demand as well, Something like engineering, given is the example here, is the most in-demand role for companies looking to hire. And apprenticeships are really, really good at doing this. Particularly, you know, engineering females in engineering has always been been quite a low number. Uh, apprenticeships are one way that we can improve improve that and increase the number of uh, female engineers coming through. Oh, sorry, missed that last bit off. So lack of experience. Yeah, often higher education degrees are academic learning. So a lot of it is academic, particularly on some courses, and it does detract from that lack of hands on experience. So they don't always get that, and which is obviously really, really important. So, yeah, we've just been through some of the uh, differences between the apprenticeships and the higher education it's up to you to weigh it up you know I'm, just because i run apprenticeships i'm not going to be saying don't go off and do higher education because we we you know we're very good at speaking to our learners and putting them on the right path to be honest and it says here way into university a levels aren't the only way things are changing uh keep using those examples of universities taking people in on who haven't got the UCAS points and some of our you know some people A levels are really tough and it's probably not the right thing for them to be doing whereas these apprenticeships they revel in they're absolutely superb in them 
So we've now come on to a few of the apprenticeships that we do run. So the, the first one is a level two, and it's called a community activated coach apprenticeship. Typical employers, schools mostly, but yeah, a lot of sport coaching companies, community clubs, and we do get some wraparound care settings as well. So it might be that they're working before school, after school to support with that childcare, uh, which, you know, I, I think schools are going to jump on in the next few years with, with uh, getting people in to support with that. I do speak to a lot of schools that struggle with that wraparound care. And this is a good way of doing it by using apprentices to come and help with it. So it's typical learner. So the majority of, of, of us for this level two, they will be between 16 and 19. It's not a given, you know, it doesn't have to have a specific age that does it. And we have had people on the level two, or we've got people on the level two at the moment who are in their 40s and they just want that experience. It's not even necessarily about the, the number of the level. It's about getting that experience within their workplace. The time on programme for this is 13 months. Uh, they have to be on programme for, for at least a year before they can go on to doing the endpoint assessment. And the endpoint assessment for this one is a period of about a month. So hence why overall it's 13 months. The endpoint assessments for, for all of them are pretty similar. They will have to be watched in the workplace. They will do a presentation and they'll have what we call a professional discussion with an assessor as well, which is effectively their interview. And they talk about their, their time during the during the apprenticeship. They answer any questions on the coursework that they might have done and give all these brilliant examples of the kind of things that they've been doing in, in the workplace. So, yeah, that, again, a lot of this is very similar. Uh, depending on the, the level that you're doing. So the, the method delivery, it, it is a day release. We at the moment do Fridays. <clears throat> so they're working within their workplace Monday to Thursday, and then they get the day release uh, for that one day a week where we deliver the course element of them. The, the course itself, it is a blended approach. So we do stuff online. We do some independent tasks and, and some research. For the learners to do and then we get that face-to-face -face, uh, practical as well which is brilliant it's a it's a lovely day when we do that uh, and the the learners come along they get some great ideas for practical activities that we're doing that they can take back into their workplace and use for themselves so they are really really valuable and uh, there aren't many apprenticeship providers that do that uh, a lot of them are 100 percent online and we've never believed in that we've always wanted that face-to-face -face route and those practical days you know they're ones that the learners really really look forward to level three teaching assistant apprenticeship so this is a new one this is the first year that we've run this and we've got quite a few on it at the moment who, who seem to be thriving in their schools it does have a little bit of a PE focus but it is more of a rounded package so they're supporting a, a lot of stuff in addition to PE. So it'd be a lot of classroom based work, working with the children uh, within their maths and English, phonics, guided reading, everything that a normal TA would be doing. The, uh, the, the apprenticeship for the teaching assistant will be covering that as well. It gives you that natural progression to become a teacher or full time member of support staff in school. So a, a lot will hopefully, after the apprenticeship, they will become employed within their school as a teaching assistant. And a lot of teaching assistants always think about, right, do I want to stay as a teaching assistant or do I want to take that next step and possibly do my teacher training? Off the job, as I said, exactly the same as for the level two. So it, it's completed once a week with that blended approach. And yeah, the, the Fridays is the same for that as well. Level three community sport and health officer. This is one that we're looking for behaviour change within the local society, getting more children, or not even children, getting more people uh, active in sport, delivering in your local communities, 
obviously with the aim of big children and uh, children and adults becoming more, more physically active. It does, this one tends to, to blend itself to more sort of community-based roles. It doesn't necessarily work as effectively in schools, right? but it's just another avenue of a apprenticeship that we do offer for somebody who wants to do something slightly different. So it could be, you know, you, you could be working in a sports role with the your local authority or a leisure industry. So th this does give you the opportunity to do this level three community sport and health officer. And again, off the job, exactly the same as the others. It's one day a week where we deliver the course and then four days a week within your workplace. And then finally, the level four sports coach. So this is the, the longest one. It's an 18 to 20 month program. We tend to put ours on for 18 months with their employers. We'll certainly suggest to the employers to do that. Uh, you do for this one, you need some prior experience of, of working with children and young people dealing within a sporting background and you do need your maths and English level two to do this one. The, the reason that the uh, the time frame is longer is a the, the coursework is probably a, a little bit more intense but also the endpoint assessment is quite a long one for this one so as, as well as having your observation and your presentation and your interview like you do with the others you also have the, the 4,500 piece work project. So that's factored into about a three month period at the end of your apprenticeship. And that gives you the time to write that project. Hence why it's 18 to 20 months that we suggest. And it, this is all about working and collaborating with, with teachers to develop pupils mastery of those psychomotor skills. So we're, we're trying to get more, more children, I suppose, uh, PE literate, uh, encouraging more active children but again we're, we're looking at that bread and butter of supporting the PE within your, your school framework and also adding value with things like extracurricular clubs and lunchtime clubs and active playgrounds and break times. So yeah you work in week, uh, you chew today, we will do either uh, practical face-to-face, -face. we'll do the coursework for you as well, which is online, and we'll sometimes be setting you what we call some independent tasks, which act as really good evidence to use in your portfolio of coursework. Uh, it might be that if you require your functional skills in English and maths, then we do that as well. The college will really support of, of this. And we want you to be able to leave with your English and maths, you know, regardless of what you go on to do. That's a really useful thing to have. Your work placement days, the, these four days, you'll be working at a primary or secondary school or coaching company for those four days. So your school, in most cases, will give you a timetable so that you know when, when you're doing things. You'll have a mentor which is allocated to you within that workplace and they'll have weekly meetings, particularly to begin with when you're finding your feet. They'll be quite formal meetings, just setting targets and making sure that everything's all right. And they support your development uh, by ensuring that you have appropriate workload and a range of opportunities. So all of these continued professional uh, development opportunities that school offer to staff, hopefully you'll be able to access some of them as well. Uh, and, we, and we want you to leave your workplace with a stack load of certificates and experience that you could put on a CV, uh, you know, when you're applying for, for another job. If you do apply for another job, you want to stay within your school. So yeah, the structure and pay, uh, we are the course provider. So you'd be employed by the school or coaching company and you're integrated as a member of staff. There's no difference in that respect. You are a fully employed member of staff. You, you know, you work under the same conditions as, as other people within the school and, you know, the, the same code of conduct as well. The minimum wage has, or it will do, have quite a significant increase. It's never had an increase as big as what, what's going to happen in, in April 2024. 
So I think the value for apprenticeships is, is you know, it's going up and up and up, and that's being reflected in, in this raise in the pay, which is great news for the apprentices. We've got one of mine here who, who was a uh, apprentice of the the month she won, and she is slightly older. She's she, she'll hate me for saying that, but she uh, has been in her school for five years, and she just wanted to do the the course uh, to get another qualification behind her, so that when she's applied for other stuff, she's got that that she can put on her CV and talk about. She is beat. She is brilliant, absolutely superb. So uh, yeah, it's always nice going into schools and presenting them with trophies and certificates for things like that. It's a job worth doing. So yeah, they're employed 40 hours per week, roughly, uh, depending on how your contract works, between sort of 35 and 40 hours per week. But that does include your your college day as well, so those Fridays. And this will include your usual your school holidays, which is always a bonus for teaching staff. And much needed as well. So what do they do? Well, they coach. So we give them some good pictures here of uh, learners learning skills that they can then take back into their workplace and use with the children or young adults or wherever they work. So, yeah, I think they really appreciate that coming back with a stack load of ideas that, that they can use. That they've learned on the college days they teach so that you know that they're teaching in many cases the pe supporting the delivery of the pe but it might be that they're doing other things as well within the classroom and for a lot of us it's probably not something that they necessarily expected to be doing but they come out of it and think oh yeah no i like spending the time in the classroom it might even in some cases sort of persuade them to go down that route but it does give them another load of experience so they coach they teach they learn so we're always giving them these opportunities this is the uh, picture of the top here which is the royal opera house that come in and, and been working with for the last few years where they come in and they give them all these ideas and resources that they can take back into their schools. Uh, they lead and they develop. I think that's really, really important. You're not necessarily getting somebody who's the, the uh, finished article. You're getting somebody who might, in some cases, be pretty green, pretty raw, uh, and uh, not had much experience within schools at all. But they develop and they take things on really, really quickly. Uh, and they learn and they're keen to learn. And yeah, there's, in, in most cases, there is a massive development throughout the year or the 18 months, depending on what course they do. And there's some nice pictures here. And these are all our apprenticeships, all our apprentices, sorry, in action. So we've got some gymnastics, got some dance. You know, we've had on the previous slide some netball. So we give them loads and loads of different sports that are relevant to what they do in their workplace. Some nice pictures here of the learning in action. So we are creating hopefully active people, okay, healthy, happy, active people. And hopefully that has answered any questions that you may have. If you want to know more, here's a QR code which will take you to our website. I'll leave that on for 30 seconds, just so that you might want to phone and zap it here and now. Okay, and if you did want to get in touch, there's some email addresses of people who would be good to get in touch with and they will answer any questions that you do have. And lastly, a uh, thank you from me. Uh, thanks for listening. Hopefully it has answered some questions and hopefully it's made you think either, yeah, I'd like to do an apprenticeship or 
I'd like to take an apprentice on. Thank you.